All right. Good evening, everyone. Uh, we'll go ahead and get started. It looks like it's just now six o'clock, and I'm sure we'll have a few more uh, people coming in here shortly. But uh, welcome to uh, week three of the University Place Community Academy. Um, I'm Greg Primo, your chief of police here, and I'm joined, as always, with my co-facilitator, uh, your public safety administrator, Jennifer Hales. Um, this week, we are going to be covering crisis intervention and de-escalation uh, overview, basically, of, of the of the training and, and all the components of that that goes into it for your officers here at UPPD and, and with the Pierce County Sheriff's Department. Um, so tonight, uh, just a couple reminders. Uh, make sure that you keep your camera turned off um, and keep yourself muted. That just helps to avoid any distractions for everybody else that's on there. Um, we will make the uh, presentation. I'll, I'll pop that up so that everybody can see the presentation now as it's going. And then you'll see the presenter hopefully down in the small box in the corner so you can see them. Um, if you have any questions as we're going, again, just use your chat function to send in those questions. And, and Jennifer will try and share those with the presenter who can answer those as we're going. Um, and I think that was about it. Anything else that I need to cover? And if they want to see. One or the other. Oh, yeah. Camera. So just a reminder, you can pin the presenter's camera. If you want to see that more than the presentation part, you can bounce between those two uh, individually. So um, you have that option. Um, I think that's about it. So I'm going to go ahead and turn this over to Sergeant Eric Clark. He's our presenter tonight. Um, he's our training sergeant for the department. And he's going to go ahead and talk about crisis intervention and, and yes, and stuff. So. Go ahead and turn that over to him. Hang on a second. No problem. Are you good? Good to go. I think we're ready. All right. Good evening, everyone out there at University Place. Uh, University Place Community Academy. I'm the training agent for the entire department, so I also handle training for all the University Place officers. My name is Sergeant Eric Clark. Uh, I've been with our department, a little background on me, 21 years. This is my 21st year. Uh, University Place has always been near and dear to my heart, as when I was a brand new baby deputy, this was my first patrol assignment. Uh, so I spent uh, several uh, months here in the summer of 99 um, before moving back to the Eastside Patrol Division, worked there on our swing shift and uh, um, evening shift for several years worked in our community support team for several years, um, was promoted to sergeant about six years ago. In that role, I served as the graveyard supervisor and the canine supervisor. And recently in the past six months, uh, moved over to the training side of the house to run the training division. Um, so in that, I supervised Deputy Alex Richards, who you met last week, who gave you the overview of the training department and our, our tasks intertwined a lot. So I'll, I'll touch on some of the stuff he spoke about, but. In addition to doing that, I also um, run our EVOC program, which is our emergency vehicle operator course, which I know he talked about. And I'm also a member of our Marine Services Unit. So you may see me in, in some of those capacities. So welcome everyone, glad to be here. Glad we could still make this work. And I have the honor of talking about crisis intervention and de-escalation tonight, which is something uh, I, th I think as we move through the evening, you'll find that is really intertwined in all assets of the, of the training and the law enforcement we do. So, an overview of what we're going to be discussing tonight is um, we're going to talk about the state sponsored training required for all officers in the state. So um, the state uh, through state law kind of runs out. So we'll talk about that. We'll talk about the curriculum that our officers receive in the criminal justice training center. And then we're going to get into de-escalation, uh, which is something that I enjoy speaking about. We'll talk about those the de-escalation training we do um, within our standard, and when I say standard, our usual disciplines of law enforcement training. So those are the topics we're gonna discuss tonight. Um, as far as the chat feature goes, I'm, I'm easy here. So if you have a question, um, uh, please don't wait until the end. I think if everyone's comfortable with that, send your send your chat in, um, they'll let me know and, and we'll try and get those answered as we, as we move along, so. Okay, so as I said, crisis intervention training in, in the state of Washington is governed by state law. It's governed by our Washington Administrative Code and the Revised Code of Washington, RCW. And I'll just read to you real quick. You can see it on your screen, but the, defi the, the defining part of the WAC is, is really what defines what is offered in the academy. So the definition of that training is training designed 
to provide tools and resources to Washington State law enforcement uh, in order to respond effectively to individuals who may be experiencing a crisis. So state law explains that as an emotional, mental, physical, behavioral, chemical dependency, crisis, distress, or problem. And that training is designed to increase the safety of the law enforcement, which is us, and the individual experiencing the crisis. So long-winded uh, definition in, in Washington State uh, Administrative Code, but um, makes a lot of sense when we get into it. So I'll take a second and talk historically about what the state mandates for us here in Pierce County, University Place, Edgewood. When I say Pierce County, um, I mean no, no disrespect to University Place, it's just Pierce County is all encompassing for the law enforcement regions here. Um, so the state guidelines, what they mandate for us is since 2008, so this is not a new issue, but since 2008, uh, recruits in the state academy receive at least eight hours of CIT training. So CIT for the acronyms tonight is crisis intervention training. Um, LE, if, if you see that acronym on the slide, that's law enforcement. LEO is law enforcement officer. So since 2008, recruits in the state, they get eight hours of at least eight hours of CIT training. That's mandated. Okay. Do they get a lot more than that? Absolutely, because CIT is intertwined in the, a lot of the avenues of the training they receive. But the state law mandates they get eight hours. So that eight hours occurs in the state police academy and at the state patrol academy at down in Shell. Following that eight hours, annually, each officer in the state, every sworn commission officer in the state, receives a mandatory two-hour CIT update training each year. And I'll go into more on what that looks like a little bit later in the presentation. And then departments are required to ensure that their personnel, some of the, the older folks like myself that went to the academy prior to 2008, we, they, the state law then requires us to also attend that same eight hour course uh, at a certain time in our career so that we all have received that same training. So obviously 08, we realize, okay, this is good. We need to implement it from here forward, but we also need to have a plan to go back and catch those folks that didn't have the opportunity to get it then. And then a percentage of our department, the, the eventual goal being everyone, but a percentage of the department starting now and moving forward uh, must receive and attend the 40 hour crisis intervention team training course, uh, which is quite a bit more involved. So some history on that, obviously with the, the, the COVID pandemic, it slowed down our opportunity for classes in 2020 because we weren't allowed to have in-person classes and that 40 hour course is an in-person interactive class. Um, we're currently, my team and um, the state are kind of, are currently working on hosting a series of those 40 hour courses coming up in 2021. So we'll host those for the Puget Sound region, uh, invite our officers to call my officers, officers from other departments that need to get that training. We'll be offering that in 21. That's our goal. So True Blood, uh, you may have heard that uh, a, a little bit in, in media these days. True Blood v. DSHS was an active lawsuit that deals with crisis intervention and, and more with the, the, the treatment side than the law enforcement side, but it does intertwine with what we do. And that's an active lawsuit that challenged the unconstitutional delays in competency evaluations, so mental health hearings and restoration services to those affected by that. Um, so the state entered a settlement that said, okay, that's correct. We're going to expand residential mental health with crisis services, which we all know is something that we need. And we're going to offer additional training for correction staff and law enforcement in those same regions. Um, you're going to get a little bit more about this next week uh, when you get to speak with the mental health co-responders, but I'll touch briefly on it just so you're aware of it. Um, the result of that has said, OK, we need to have additional forensic evaluators and more mental health professionals. And the goal of that is to educate the courts to meet the needs of those that are waiting in correctional facilities for that mental health treatment. And this is implemented in phases started in July 2019. So it's not a new, uh, definitely a new thing. Started in July of 19 through 2021. And, and the integration starts first with the Southwest region, Spokane region, and the Pierce region. King County, after June 2021, will start their integration into that. And the implementation plan is, is basically based on your higher population areas first. Okay, so they're taking all the areas that have the, the most need for services, get them first, and then as they, the eventual plan will be encompass the entire state. So there's lots of moving parts to the true blood, um, but I'll let the mental health folks touch on that next week because they're the, they're the experts in that field. Any questions so far over there? Are we doing good? Okay, great. Okay, so. The, the meat of the matter is the crisis intervention training that we receive. So as I as I mentioned earlier, we have those eight hour courses. We have a two hour course and a 40 hour course. So I'll take a minute to explain those to you. 
The eight hour course is your basic integration into crisis intervention that our, that our recruits see in the academy. So this course provides up to date materials, skills, public relations information on dealing with mental ill individuals uh, while those officers are on duty. So it's offered in the basic law enforcement academy, state patrol, and CJTC up in Beering and the Spokane Academy. So those officers come out with for sure that eight hours and then that that crisis intervention is also intertwined into all the other disciplines that they learn in the academy. Our two hour courses, which are pretty unique, those are the ones we talked about that are mandatory for every officer in the state every year receives this two hour course. Um, that course content changes and, and that content is set by the state. And it's unique because every year it changes to a different topic. So this year, so it's it's really meaningful training for officers. Um, and I'll explain that in two years ago, the focus was autism. So it was a two hour block of instruction that focused on autism. So it gave officers um, that maybe perhaps didn't know that much about autism, a chance to learn about that, learn how to deal with people that are dealing with that uh, in their personal and family lives. This year, it dealt with traumatic brain injury, which is another thing we see in our region with the military coming home. And um, it gave our officers a chance to learn about that in the state. So each of those trainings is consists of a two hour presentation, which is followed by a mandatory skills test to ensure that that the folks uh, watching the training understood it. And that's for all commissioned in the state. And now we move into the 40 hour course, which is is kind of the uh, the extra credit version of it, but it's the one that eventually we want everyone to get through. This is where experts in the field of crisis intervention, they come in and they, they educate your law enforcement about mental illness, chemical dependency, and all the things that go along with that, brain disorders. Uh, there's, an, there's a segment in there about uh, adult protective services, so elderly issues. Uh, students will also learn communication skills dealing with CIT, report writing dealing with CIT, legal updates, and they'll learn through a combination of presentations from the presenters and mock scenes. So this is why where that in-person class becomes important because we actually set up scenarios and they do role playing and they have a chance to practice the things they learned in the class. And there's a few few new classes coming online that they're in the process of um, developing right now. And those are the historical intersection of race and policing, alternatives to booking. So alternatives to booking someone into jail, implicit and explicit bias, and building respectful relationships with others. So there's some new of that stuff, new stuff that's coming online that will, that will be integrated into our 2021 40 hour courses. So the second part of today's talk is about de-escalation, and that's uh, something that I enjoy talking about because I think it's an opportunity for us to explain, you know, what what many of us hear as a word is actually a thing that we do in the field. So. De-escalation, crisis intervention and de-escalation are, are fairly new terms that we've heard recently. Um, we've heard them in the media, we've heard them in some, some general uh, national discussions, but fortunately for you in our area, in the Pierce County region, we've been practicing and implementing uh, these tactics and this training for years. Um, many departments across the nation have little to no CIT training or de-escalation training. Uh, and you can rest assured that the Pierce County law enforcement community, the entire sound Puget Sound community is well ahead of many parts of the country as it relates to the escalation training. And we have a question. Yes. Who produces the course material or where does it come from? So I'm assuming you're asking about the, the two, the eight and the 40 hour courses. Those are all state sponsored. So they reach out to the experts in those fields. So they reach out um, and, and forgive me, I don't know who the expert was on, on autism, but they would reach out to those experts. They would work with doctors in the region uh, mental health professionals in the region, they would develop a curriculum and then they would vet that curriculum and and then that would be pushed out to the officers. So hopefully that answers your question. If it didn't, check back in. I know for the traumatic brain injury role in last year, they had um, several military doctors that talked about that um, and several surgeons in the area that I think also consulted on it. So, so, so at, the, at the state level, at the academy, there's people that are sort of correct. reaching out to... Correct. Okay. Yes, the, the state academy has a whole division that's dedicated to crisis intervention and the CIT courses. And they, on the two hour courses, they set that course content for the 40 hour course. They supply, they facilitate it. They, they supply funding to help it along. They help find us experts to come and talk. And then we, we provide the venue and bring the people in and do the training. So de-escalation. So here's your definition of de-escalation. Very simple definition, which I like because the reduction of the intensity of a conflict or potentially violent situation. 
So that definition of de-escalation is in and of itself successful law enforcement. And you can, you can do that slide up. So if you read and understand this definition at, at its basic core meaning, this is what law enforcement officers do each and every single day. Law enforcement is and always has been committed to peacefully resolving each and every situation in which we respond. We protect and serve. That's de-escalation at its core. Um, and we resolve conflict in many ways at many different levels, as I'm sure you're aware. But I'd like to present you two quick scenarios to kind of demonstrate um, an actual tangible example of de-escalation in the field. So at a basic level, let's look at a traffic collision. So let's say you or somebody you know is involved in a traffic collision with another motorist and someone calls 911 and law enforcement responds. So we first show up, we ensure that no one is injured, we determine potential fault, we facilitate the exchange of necessary information, insurance information and driver's license and phone numbers. We issue appropriate citations if there's fault, perhaps we may make an arrest, and then we safely remove those inoperable vehicles from the roadway. So if you look at that at its basic level, we just de-escalated that situation. We ensured there was no conflict between the two parties, and we reduced the intensity and the confusion of the situation, hence the escalation. So I'll give you an example of a little bit more advanced level. We'll take a look at a domestic violence incident. So let's say there's a domestic violence incident and law enforcement is dispatched and they arrive on scene. We start by separating the involved parties, which de-escalates the situation. We conduct interviews. We check for injured parties. We ensure the safety of any children involved. We then seek to resolve the situation. So that resolution can be accomplished from the level of simply calming people down and facilitating a conversation between them. That resolution may be we have to make an arrest and remove someone from that situation, or it may be the violator is now gone and we need to seek and help that subject uh, obtain a protection order to ensure their further safety uh, down the road. People often call 911 because they are in a crisis, need help, or a witness someone else having a crisis or needing help, or there's been violence. So it's our job as law enforcement officers to intervene in that situation, help manage that crisis for them, de-escalate it, and find a safe resolution. That's essentially at the root of what law enforcement is. So training about de-escalation. And I can tell you, and I think you'll understand once I'm done explaining this, is that um, de-escalation training in and of itself is something we incorporate into every avenue of every training we do. So in some of the recent national conversations regarding law enforcement, you've heard experts on TV, uh, they say, well, we, we need more reality-based training, and we need more situational training, and we need more scenario training, and we need more de-escalation training. Well, the good news is, all law enforcement agrees with that. And the even better news is, is that in, in the Pierce County community, that's something we've been doing and our partner agencies have been doing for years. We literally have been doing this for years. We recognize long ago that this is one of the most successful ways to train police officers. In order to de-escalate others, law enforcement must first learn how to de-escalate themselves. Okay, that comes through multitasking, that comes through training to be comfortable in their situation. That, train, that comes with training with stress management so that officers know how to de-escalate de themselves so they can safely help someone else through a crisis. Yeah, we just attended a, a national training event with the Neuro Leadership Institute, and they were talking about stress. And one thing that struck me is interesting they talked about, they said stress is contagious. People often mirror the behavior that is presented to them. So imagine if you're having a crisis and we'll say crisis is, is a problem. A crisis can be small to big, but let's say you're having a crisis and the very person you called to assist you wasn't trained to handle a crisis. So imagine how unsuccessful that interaction would be when that person you're counting on to help you, they can't help you because they can't handle the stress of even being in a situation that you're in. So we combat that, law enforcement combats that issue by training our recruits and continuing to train our veteran officers through safe and sound tactics, excellent communication skills, self-defense techniques, which you learned about from Sergeant Youngman last week, and de-escalation training. So de-escalation training really incorporates all those components and it incorporates the three critical principles of police, ta police tactics that give us the best option to resolve dangerous situations. Those three tactics are time, distance, and shielding. 
And, and I'll explain that a little bit later, but anytime we can add time, distance and shielding or cover or safety from danger, we can effectively manage that crisis and we can effectively bring it to a safe resolution. So effective de-escalation is not just words is basically what I'm trying to get at. Effective de-escalation requires us to not only use effective patrol tactics, but also knowledge about mental illness, hence our CIT training, communication techniques, and human physiology in general. So I'll take a minute and explain how crisis intervention and how de-escalation integrates into our, our core training principles. Um, so we've got our emergency vehicle operations course, we've got firearms training, we've got defensive, defensive tactics, and then I'll talk a little bit about uh, negotiation skills. But those are kind of the core question. Yes. Go ahead. So, um, before you hit this this slide, the yes. question was: How often is the training required? Is it every year? Okay. So last week, I know Deputy Richards touched on that, and I will touch on this again. So our de-escalation training is integrated into all the training disciplines that we do, which I'll discuss briefly. So, for a patrol uniform position, firearms training is is uh, 20 hours a year, so two days a year. Defensive tactics is 10 hours a year, and our emergency vehicle operations course is 10 hours a year. Then we also receive 10 hours of uh, a classroom training where we deal with um, things like our CIT two-hour training, our legal updates, our, our crisis updates, and things of that nature. So um, the state requires 23 hours, 24 hours, forgive me, 24 hours a year. Um, we, uh, our officers, almost every single one of them double that easily every year with, with the training we do. And our de-escalation uh, training is integrated into each of the skill sets that we do. So hopefully that answered that question. I'm going to go into more detail on that so it'll make sense here in a second. Uh, but we'll start with um, first our EVOC. So I'm going to use EVOC as an acronym. That's anything driving related. Okay, that's a, a passion of mine. I'm an instructor for that and help write some of our curriculum. So a lot of people think about driving. Okay, well, why is that a de-escalation item? Why why do you have to manage crisis in driving? Well, if you can imagine uh, a high-speed vehicle pursuit or, or a priority run when you see a, a patrol car with lights and sirens going to a significant incident, that's stressful. That's stressful for that officer. That's stressful for the citizens around them. And that's something that we need to teach our officers to manage so they can do it safely. So we in, in the Sheriff's Department have integrated scenario-based training that involves pursuit decision making and the safe resolution of vehicle pursuits at our drive course. So we actually set up scenarios and where we create mock pursuits and, and put um, our students, our deputies, in the opportunity to practice those safe driving skills, which they've learned throughout the day, to practice decision making skills, to practice that crisis management, to practice that stress management in a controlled environment so that they have practice to do that for when they're on the street. We have the means to de-escalate a vehicle pursuit by using tools at our disposal. We can control intersection, we can use stop stick devices to sl slow cars down, and we can use pursuit intervention techniques to end that pursuit. So we can de-escalate that pursuit. Our goal in every uh, vehicle pursuit is to de-escalate that to a safe ending. So we spend time training our staff annually on how to safely manage those pursuits, how to bring them to a safe and swift, a quick end, because the safer and the sooner a vehicle pursuit is over, it's better for everyone involved and it's safer for everyone involved. We also spend a significant amount of time training our, our people to drive in a priority manner while they're multitasking. Okay, law enforcement officers have a lot going on inside the car and we need them to be able to be comfortable driving at high speeds and do so safely. So we teach them to drive at the drive course while listening to the police radio, while talking on the microphone, while communicating with their partners, while making decisions about what they're gonna do when they get to the call safely. So that's one way that uh, maybe you haven't thought about before. That's one way we integrate de-escalation into driving. Firearms training. So everyone knows that law enforcement goes out and obviously we, we use the weapons that we've been provided with and we practice to make sure we're proficient in those skills. But we also practice to make sure uh, that, that we're using de-escalation skills uh, when presented with those situations. So we utilize scenario-based training. You'll hear that a lot. We do that a lot because it works. We utilize that scenario-based training where officers encounter mock scenes. And they must use their verbal skills and safe approach tactics, that time, distance, and shielding, to de-escalate an incident. So even though we're at the range and we're doing firearms-based training, if an officer 
uses proper tactics in the scenario I'm speaking of, that scenario is set up to resolve to end without them ever firing a weapon. So which is a successful which is a successful ending for law enforcement also. So that's one way we integrate that de-escalation training into our firearms training. I'll talk about defensive tactics training briefly. I know that uh, Sergeant Youngman spoke with you last week about this. He's an expert in the field, um, uh, does a wonderful job presenting that material. So I'll touch just briefly on that because I don't want to take anything away from him. But we spend a great deal of time training our officers how to be safe when dealing with combative subjects. OK, that's one of the places where officers um, can get hurt very quickly and very easily. Um, an example of this training would be in our annual training at defensive tactics. We have a scenario set up where we have officers again presented with a scenario, a mock scene, where if they utilize the de-escalation techniques they've been taught, that time, distance, shielding, that verbal communication with the with the subject, there's no force necessary. The situation resolves itself without using force. The academy uses a similar uh, scenario with our new recruits. We were just up there several weeks ago, watching them go through their final mock scenes, which is their final uh, practical test. And they have a crisis scene where uh, a suicidal person has a knife and, and they're required to use the skills, the verbal skills and that time distance and shielding um, that they've learned while being at that academy to bring that to a safe resolution. And if done properly, the scene resolves with the person with the knife. They open up a dialogue with that person. They set the knife down and they allow themselves to be escorted out of the room to be taken for mental health treatment, which is a successful resolution. Um, I'm going to talk briefly about, and I'll say hostage negotiators because that's the term that Hollywood likes to use uh, when it comes to tactical teams or SWAT teams that we see in the movies. Um, we call them negotiators. And negotiators are some of our best officers at managing a crisis. And they're some of our best officers at de-escalation. Our SWAT team employs a staff of highly trained officers whose sole job on that SWAT team is to de-escalate a hostile or violent subject and bring that situation to a safe resolution. And that's that's one thing folks often don't think about when they see a SWAT team uh, on, on TV or on the news serving a warrant or something of that nature that on every one of those teams, there's several people and their sole job is to de-escalate that situation so that no force at all has to be used. So tools for de-escalation should see that up on your screen there. Um, you've heard me touch on mental health co-responders. Uh, there's going to be more about this next week because they're next up on the list. They're going to come in and talk to you. Great asset for law enforcement. This is a, a program that uh, Pierce County piloted for our area several years ago. We're up and running now. I think um, we have 24 hour coverage. Um, great, great program. It allows officers to go in the field with a co-responder um, and deal with situations collectively. If the situ if law enforcement goes and makes sure it's safe, and the co-responder is there and they start handling the mental health aspect and they're comfortable, law enforcement can then leave, go to go to another priority call, and that co-responder can see that call, can see that incident through to a safe resolution, provide them services, get them help, take them in for an evaluation. Great tool, awesome tool. They're going to tell you all about it next week, so I don't want to steal any of their thunder, but great tool. Uh, surveillance techniques, maybe something you don't think about with de-escalation that much. Highly classified information, of course, but we have surveillance techniques that allow us to aid in making situations safer that provide us that time distance and shielding. We have uh, equipment that allows us to view a situation and see what we're going into before we step into it so we don't force a confrontation when maybe we don't have to. Our crisis negotiators talked about that. Oh, question. How are the situations assessed in terms of training? How is it determined if an officer passes? <clears throat> OK, so back to those mock scenes. So we have we have scenes set up for um, both. So in the de-escalation scene I talked about up at the academy, the goal of that scene, a passing score would be to use those skills, use time and distance, use the de-escalation skills to get that to resolve peacefully. So if if the subject sets a knife down, if the officer does a good job establishing that rapport and that communication, if the officer uses safe distance, doesn't just rush right up to the person. They keep a safe distance and communicate. Um, then, then, then they would be passing. Now, we would also have other scenes where, um, for instance, at our firearms training center, where we do, where you're confronted with an armed person who's firing rounds at you. Obviously, the appropriate response for that would be to engage that suspect. So, those scenes to do that would be passing. Hopefully, that makes that clears that up. Our negotiators I talked about briefly, so I won't go back into that. 
And then another tool we have for de-escalation uh, are less than lethal munitions. So these, some of these tools aid us in bringing a safe resolution without uh, using deadly force in a situation. And I'll give you an example of that here in just a moment. So and you can stay on that slide. So, and I'll give you a first hand. Do we have any more questions before I jump into this? Okay, great. So uh, a first hand story, which I always appreciate because it's real. Um, we had a few years ago, I was a graveyard supervisor. And uh, I'm going to give you an example of how we use one of those tools. That I, we actually used almost all those tools I just talked about to bring a safe resolution. So we got a 911 call from a mother and she said, my adult son just showed up at my house. Um, he's armed with a knife. He appears to be high on something. He, he has been known to be a drug user and he says he's suicidal. Okay, he's running around the yard. I can't control him. I'm afraid. Okay, reasonable. Law enforcement shows up. Myself and several other officers on my team show up there. We park away, right? We're not just going to rush right up that situation. So we use that time and that distance. On the way there, we're learning about what's going on about the person. We're getting updates from dispatch. We get the area contained, meaning we make sure that no one else can get in so we can deal with what we're dealing with. We make contact with the subject. We encourage him to sit down while we're taking cover behind trees. He's still armed with a knife and we start to begin that dialogue with him. OK, so we're starting to use that de-escalation, even at the point where we park our cars, we're starting to de-escalate by using that time and distance to our advantage. So we started talking to the subject. Um, he has superficially cut his arms a little bit, but nothing that required immediate attention. Uh, we made the decision to bring in a co-responder, one of our mental health co-responders, because we had him contained where he couldn't run away and get away. He was absolutely a danger to himself, armed with a knife potentially a danger to others. As we didn't know what his demeanor was going to be and his mother was still in the house. Um, so we bring in a mental health co-responder to start communicating with him, establish a dialogue, see if he needs services, see what's going on. Um, didn't really get very far with that. He didn't want to communicate with that person. That didn't end up working. Our next step was we called one of our negotiators from the SWAT team out to speak with him and talk with him. Also didn't go anywhere, didn't get anywhere. We then made the decision to have uh, one of our SWAT team members deploy with a 40 millimeter impact round, which is which is not a firearm, but a, but a basically in essence a large rubber bullet. Um, and we had that weapon at our disposal. And as we as we talked to him, we we for several hours we weren't getting anywhere. He wasn't moving, and we started to see blood coming down the subject's neck. And then when we looked with binoculars, we could see he he had actually significantly cut his neck with the knife while he was conversing with us. We at that time made the decision that it was important for his safety uh, to disarm him of that knife and to go in and get him help men, uh, medical aid as soon as we could. So what we had the officer do is we had him shoot that rubber bullet right on the hand of the individual that was holding the knife. That caused him to drop the knife. Then our officers were able to safely move in, uh, make sure he wasn't armed anywhere else and get him immediate medical attention off to the hospital for treatment. So long drawn out call, but we actually went through every one of those de-escalation techniques we talked about. We went through every one of the tools basically at our disposal to bring that to a safer resolution. So if you look at the opposite of, of doing what we did, imagine if an officer with no training and no experience in any of those areas would have just raced up, confronted the man at close distance, could potentially have had a, a very fatal outcome. So. Now I've given you a bit of an extreme example. I'll, pre I'll present you with a, a more routine call. No routine calls in law enforcement, as we know, but <clears throat> I'll explain how officers utilize the escalation every day in their day to day duties. So an officer receives a 911 call from a neighbor who hears loud crashing noises and yelling coming from a neighbor's residence. Very common call for us. That 911 call receiver takes the first steps at de-escalation by asking the caller information about the residence. What do you know about your neighbor? You know, how many people live there? Are they armed? What do they do for work? They then relay that information to the officer. The officer then starts to do his or her own research, such as researching prior contacts at that residence, criminal checks of the residence, associated vehicles with the residence. They then take all that information. They decide how many officers they need for the call. They coordinate arriving at the same time. They arrive and they park a safe distance away, provide them safe cover, time, and observation from a distance. So again, they're doing that time, distance, and shielding, observing and seeing what they have. They then choose to approach tactically and, and they talk about how they're going to contact the residents inside. Will one go to the back? Will one go to the front? I can already see someone in the window. They're going to have that conversation. Once the residents are contacted, 
They separate the parties, maintain visual observation of each other, so they're maintaining safety, while they conduct field interviews to determine what happened. And then those officers will make a collective decision on how to best resolve the incident based on what they've learned. So that may seem very basic, and you may have seen that play out on TV a million times, but in each step in that process, officers are effectively de-escalating that incident, and, and they're providing the opportunity for a safe resolution for that incident. The officers in your community do this many times during a shift and countless times in their career. Some of them, after years, they don't even realize that they are de-escalating, but they're doing it. So successful law enforcement is basically at its core de-escalation. So that's my spiel for the evening. Hopefully there's some questions in the chat there. I didn't go too long as I know Sergeant Youngman kept you late last week, um, but I'll do my best to answer any questions that you may have. I couldn't have answered all the questions. Letting people marinate a little on. <clears throat> I'm still on camera already. Right? You didn't have any any you, anything you could expand on okay, right, that you were okay. thinking? Uh, no, I just have a couple comments I'll share. Okay. Oh, so here we go. Got one. Good. Thank you. As Can't let me off the hook that easy. Yes. <laughs> As a part of the de-escalation training, does the department provide mental health checkups for officers? Uh, great question, yes. And you're gonna hear from a doctor that uh, works with our department in that field in two more weeks? Yes, yes. final, that, that's the ending. She'll be the, she'll be the final presenter. So um, yes, we do, and I'm gonna let her cover that because she's an expert in that. But yes, our the mental health of our own officers is absolutely a concern. That's something we absolutely focus on. Two weeks, yeah. Okay. Um, comment very thorough answered all of my questions here comes another question great how, how do you deal with language difficulties and sign language like like language barriers i'm guessing good question um that's a great question and that's something i've had to deal with um in fact i remember the very first time i had to deal with it so we've got uh language lines we've got um uh, a video we can set up on our computers that that we use uh, uh, for ASL when we have to when we have to communicate in the field. Um, it's absolutely something we provide at the jail upon booking. Um, it's something we provide in the field. Um, obviously, with the with the advent of laptops, um, works very well for uh, typing on, open up a Word document to communicate back and forth and, and figure out what's happened. Um, but yeah, we do have those resources for. Uh, sign language and we also have resources for other language barriers we have a language line we can call in um, and we basically have an interpreter right there right at hand that we're able to communicate back and forth so we use others in the field that have that uh, and we also <clears throat> we have several officers in our field um, that are well versed in, in uh, many different languages actually um, great asset to have those guys around um, we utilize them a lot and they're more than happy to help out does the department conduct routine after report analysis of major events and how does this get reported to the to the P? I guess public maybe is what, public? what she's getting at. Yeah, so we absolutely do. Um, this is going to be this is obviously evolving with, with state law, but now you've got what is essentially a regional task force. So anytime a major law enforcement incident happens, um, the regional task force is going to come in. That's got representatives from all local law enforcement at the state level uh, on down. <clears throat> They're going to do a thorough review of that incident, uh, independent investigation. Um, as far as the training and discipline and, and the disciplines and things internally, we have uh, at the county what's called the Board of Professional Standards. So every significant incident um, is, is investigated and looked at from a training perspective, <clears throat> from an officer mental health perspective, from a tactical perspective, from all driving perspective. We have experts in every one of the fields on that, and they'll look at, okay, here's what happened. How did it happen? Why did it happen? Is there training we can do that will help that not to happen in the future? Um, did they do everything they were trained? Uh, and then we'll have an internal review of that. So it's it's really twofold. You'll you have your your independent investigation, obviously, um, that we're all familiar with, and then we have we do an internal also, and we we also do that for um, vehicle collisions. We have a, a review board that reviews all vehicle collisions, and then. Uh, gives training recommendations based on that. And Eric, I just I'm just kind of thinking ahead yep. what, what people are thinking. Um, and um, talk a little bit about because you're a sergeant in addition to being a training sergeant. 
talk a little bit about like you get your guys hired, they're working, they're out in the field, they're newbies, they're excited, they're doing their thing, and then five, six, seven, eight years down the line, what are the checks and balances um, in the field when maybe those um, filters or those, you know, the shield that the little layers that you started talking uh -huh. about start to become, you start to notice, right? Something's wrong, something's not right. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about what, how that, how that person would be supervised, how that follow up would occur? Yeah, so we encourage, um, and again, you'll hear a little bit more about this in two weeks, but we encourage all of our officers to stay, uh, you know, mentally healthy. As a supervisor, you get to know your people, so you look for for signs to look for. Obviously, um, tardiness is a big one, really. You know, if you have someone that's always punctual and they start to be tardy, uh, their appearance starts to change a little bit. Maybe they, they start putting on weight when that's something that's not normal for them. Um, their their hair gets to start get a little long. You start to pick up on those little cues, um, I, I think, is kind of the avenue you're getting at. And so then you start reaching out to those folks, um, you know, as a, as a peer, as a peer, not necessarily as a supervisor, because there hasn't been anything like that. You look at complaints, you know, oftentimes um, there's sometimes in an officer's career where they become a little bit shorter with people than they used to be. And you become very aware of that because citizens will call in and say, hey, this officer come out. And last time I saw him, he was great. And today, just really short with me and, you know, wasn't wasn't very friendly. And those are obviously those are that's important for us to know as supervisors. And then those are some of those cues that we can kind of keep track of those people and, and check on their mental health. OK, some questions come in since I asked that question. Okay. Um, are officers resolution reports assessed regularly to identify or prompt additional training in specific areas of de-escalation? So resolution report would meaning the uh, the report they write about the incident. I'm guessing um, absolutely all of our, all of our reports are are read each night by a supervisor, and um, any use of force reports are 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 analyzed for trends. We do a, we do a, a internal review of that every year to see what kind of trends we're seeing in use of force incidents and what kind of calls that's occurring on. Um, but yes, absolutely in, in any avenue where we address. As simple as a vehicle collision that that maybe or they backed into a post at the precinct so we'll have that person go out and and do some extra training in that avenue to try and help them not do that anymore and and that's at its very basic level but we do that at every level yeah. eric can you talk a little bit about the makeup of our training unit in the terms of it's not just you and it's not just us. <coughs> we have instructors absolutely how many there are and then how they kind of feed where our training curriculum starts to develop because of their experience. Yeah, so, and the chief brings up an excellent point. We have experts in all disciplines of law enforcement in Pierce County. Um, it's amazing. So you met Sergeant Youngman, he obviously runs our DT program, our defensive tactics program. But under him, he's got a whole cadre of instructors that are also master instructors uh, that guide and lead that training and look for trends. Our firearms is no different. At our, out at our firearms facility, we have a principal instructor but he has a cadre of instructors that, that attend training classes throughout the year to get updated on new tactics, on new equipment that keep that update and relevant. I, I am obviously in charge of the EVOC program, but I have a cadre of instructors that work for me um, that, that teach all the same things that I do. Um, so we have that those cadres that we rely on and we've got experts in, we've got folks that are trained in the crisis intervention training that are state certified instructors in that that we call upon to teach our folks that. Um, our training is really, uh, you know, there's a lot of smaller departments that come to us for training, and that's great. We love that. We love to have that. We love to host that. But we've got experts in just about every field. We've got combat medics on our department that used to serve in that capacity in the military, and now they're with us. So they provide us training on how to provide, um, you know, emergency medical care, and emergency first aid to to citizens in the field. Um, but our our training unit is, uh, yeah, it's. It, the in charge of it is small, but the, the overarching tentacles that reach out and touch everyone is is, is giant. Eric, yes. A few more questions coming more in. More questions, great. What de-escalation techniques do you use when bystanders or family members are emotionally and physically involved as you are on site? Great question. Um, that goes two different ways. So in the field, one way, sometimes, de depending on the individual having the crisis, um, sometimes with children, um, an adult or family member can help that, right? Because they're comfortable with that person. They can help facilitate us help. You know, hey, the officer's here to help. Let's tell them what's going on, uh, things of that nature. Other times, um, and, and based on the age or what the, the person has going on, sometimes that family member makes it worse. And we understand that they, 
that they're upset about the crisis. And, you know, they're in a crisis because the person they called is in a crisis. And sometimes um, having them in the room does not de-escalate, it escalates. So we have to calmly find a way to remove them from the situation so we can safely deal with the person. You know, there's often times when, you know, if someone's armed, we really don't have the luxury of all hanging out in the room together, as, as I'm sure you can imagine for obvious reasons. So there's sometimes we have to tell family members, hey, trust us, we're gonna take care of this, stay outside safely, and we're gonna go deal with this situation. So um, I've done it both ways. I've, I've had family members be involved and, and, it's, and it's worked out great. And there's times when I've had to have them leave because they're making it worse. How have the department's techniques changed over the course of your career, <laughs> or have they stayed the same? Can you share examples of those changes, if any? Um, yeah, yes, they have changed. Absolutely. Um, we're, we're a very progressive department. Um, we, we try to stay ahead of the time so that we're ready when the next thing comes. Um, trying to think of some specific examples. I mean, law enforcement as, as a whole changes over the years. Um, we learn to be better communicators, the more experience we have on the job. Um, trying to think of a, a technical specific example. As far as you know, some of the munition stuff I spoke about earlier, some of those things weren't even around. You know, when I first hired on the when I first hired on the job, we had pepper spray and we had a stick and we had a gun. And um, you know, now we have all these wonderful tools that help us de-escalate situations, such as our tasers, uh, which is which is you know a, a brief second of pain and then compliance, which helps us. Which I know you saw demonstrated last week, but that helps us bring about safe resolution. Um, we've got those those uh, impact rounds I talked about earlier. We've got advancements in, in weaponry that allows us to be safer. The surveillance techniques I talked about, whereas before, you know, maybe in a tactical event, we would have gone in sooner because we didn't really know what was going on. But now we've got the opportunity to say, well, the, the bad guy is separate from the victims right now, and we can keep him on this side of the house. So we're going to wait to get them out safely and then deal with him. So there's, there's a lot of technological advancements um, that have that have brought about great change and, and great safety. A lot of advancements in vehicles. Our vehicles handle completely better and the braking uh, and the safety systems are completely better than they uh, used to be. So that keeps our folks safer in the cars. We've got advancements in uh, ways that we can end vehicle pursuits. They have some really neat equipment out there uh, that's coming online right now with some GPS tracking. And so there's tech technology has made us has, has made us safer. And, and to be honest, we've evolved. I mean, law enforcement is evolving. We're anyone that's been in law enforcement for any length of time would be naive if they said you can do law enforcement now the same as you did 20 years ago. You absolutely can't because society is different. We have more challenges now. We, we have more mental illness than we did. It, it's a fact. We have more chemical dependency than we did. So we have to evolve with that and and um, and stay ahead of that curve. I was going to ask on that. Um, would you say when you came, when you got hired, would you say that the mental health calls, that, or, that component yes. now, would you say that is just egregiously increased? Yes, absolutely. Yes. Is, I mean, that, that's a that's a problem that plagues our not just our community, but the entire nation. I mean, the mental health um, situation is drastic. It's drastic. And um, that's why we have tried to get ahead of that, because you um, you know, law enforcement were taxed with a lot of different with a lot of different um, jobs throughout the night, and um, we can't do all of it. So we brought in the co-responders to help take some of that burden. And what a great program! I mean, because the, those those mental health calls are, are absolutely increasing, and now you've got some new stuff through True Blood coming online. Hopefully, some more beds and some more places to take them. We're in the process in the county right now building um, temporary mental health facilities so that officers, if they have someone in a crisis. Instead of taking them to the hospital, which isn't really equipped for that type of treatment, we can take them to a true dedicated mental health facility. And and uh, but again, I don't want to get too far into that. It's co-responders. They'll talk about that next week, and I want to take all their content from them. Okay. When developing scenario training of any kind, is race deliberately introduced factor? Um, not to my knowledge. Um, no. The state may integrate some of that, but I'm not. I, I would I would be afraid to speak on that because I don't know for sure. But not at our level, no, it's not. It would be great if more success stories were publicized and all that goes into the situation to let people know what, how much officers have have to assess and skills that have to be used in, great. in ordinary interactions. Yeah. So, um, great point. I am. Uh, I'm not a Facebook guy. Um, 
just not, but we have uh, folks at our department that publish our stories about what happened on Facebook. It's a public page, so it's my understanding anyone can, you don't have to have an account or uh, anything special. You can go in there and read those, and, and they do a great job of explaining incidents that um, have happened and and step by step what the officer saw, what they did, how it came to a safe resolution. Um, and, and so that's that's something that's new in the, in the last few years, but we absolutely do that. And that's probably the best avenue I think we yeah. have for that. Um, just find the Pierce County Sheriff's Department yep. on Facebook. Pierce County like Sheriff it. Facebook and yep. you know, follow it and, then and you'll you see can, those stories. Yep. And if you like it and join it, then it gives you the updates every time they push one out. We have a Twitter account too, but I believe the Facebook one uh, is updated. Yep. And it's, and it's really very yeah, great, great content on yeah. there. Okay. Good pictures too. Good funny stories about guys lassoing mm -hmm. animals and different things. All kinds of fun stuff. Okay, how do you feel about the idea of having social workers working alongside you routinely? Do you feel like that's a good or a bad idea? Great idea, absolutely, without question. The the, the co-responders we have are amazing folks. Uh, you're going to meet them next week. I mean, for me, it's a, it's another you know we call law enforcement a tool belt, right? We have belts on our tool for different for different situations. Uh, amazing for me as a patrol guy to respond to a call and, and someone in distress and 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 a call responder can say I got this I know exactly what to do I know how to get them services you can go to your call I'm going to handle this one what a great resource yeah I don't think you'll find anyone in law enforcement who's going to argue about that great resource and work hand in hand with them we take them they've been integrated into some of our training so they know um, what we do and, and what our goal our goal is at, at calls and they know what our equipment looks like and how we use it um, and we know what they do. So yeah, great, great partnership. Okay. Are some situations more effectively de-escalated or resolved by officers who are female or officers who are male? I assume mm -hmm. some people may respond differently depending on the gender of the officer. Yep. Is that correct? That's absolutely correct. Um, that's something we use um, in negotiations oftentimes. If if we have, uh, let's, I'll use myself. So let's say I'm there talking to the subject. I'm not getting you. He won't even look at me. He, she won't even look at me. They won't talk to me. We're going to change that up. We're going to find someone else who's different than me, different style, different voice, quieter, louder, happier, sadder, whatever. And we're going to give them a shot and see if they relate to them. Um, our negotiators use that tactic all the time. Um, I've I've worked with great people of, of, of all the genders in my time in law enforcement. But um, yeah, there's there's absolutely a time when a, a female officer will be able to communicate better in that situation than I will just based on their life experience. And there may be times when I'm able to communicate in that situation based on my life experience. So we use those, um, uh, I won't say cheat, but we, yes, we use that tactic quite a bit. It was mentioned that the department took it upon itself to update its CIT in 2008. Where do you see the department going in the next 12 years? Yeah, so 2008 was the start of the state-run program. Um, I think in the I think in the in the coming years, the next 12 years, I think you're going to see more training. You know, and uh, when I started my career 20 years ago, I remember being told that by the in 20 years, a third of your time will be spent training. Now we're not to that level yet. We'd like to be because the more training we can get, frankly, the better. Um, we still have limited resources, and we still have to do um, you know handle calls for service. But I think. I think you're going to see all these trends continue, and, and, and it's and it's good training. It's good things. You know, we, as I mentioned in earlier slides, you know, we talk. Of, we you watch on the national media, and, the, and law enforcement across the nation is not like it is here. There's some spots that are great. I'm not saying we're. I mean, I am saying we're the greatest because I'm biased, but um, <laughs> the good kind of biased. But um, we're ahead of the game. I mean, you can rest easy that we are. We are aware of, of, of the of the pitfalls that are happening in other parts of the country and making sure that we don't make those mistakes. Um, so I think that we're kind of leading the West Coast law enforcement kind of leads the leads the charge on that. And I think it's only going to keep going. I think we're just going to we're going to get more training and more immersion into different uh, mental health stuff that, that we have to deal with. Um, you know, I think you're going to see a big push towards trying to figure out you know, safe resolution for the opiate problem. I mean, that's a huge thing that we, that we all see and face, uh, coupled intertwined with mental health. Um, so I think those are all things that, that we're going to see more of as we move forward. Yeah, and I just want to add, Eric, um, Chief and I have had lots of conversations recently about ways in, in just in our little small community mm -hmm. that we can sort of look at the calls, the things that we're going to, right. and figure out a way that, that maybe other people should be handling those calls. And right. I know... Uh, Chief had shared some information happening in San Francisco where the fire department is now 
taking on these teams, these strategic mm. teams and going out and handling a lot of this. Yeah, that'd be great. And Oregon, <laughs> I know, in Oregon, uh, what where the Ducks are in Eugene, they have something called cahoots where they have these these broad teams mm-hmm. um, that are even, I think, probably co-responders on steroids. Correct, correct. And I think, I, I really feel like the public um, is, you know, it's going to cost money, yeah. but these things have to be funded um, that way or yes. law enforcement will continue to be put in the scenarios. Right, yeah, we do, you know, law enforcement is a stopgap. I mean, let's, let's, let's be honest, you know, when all else fails, you call 911. We get it. That's a, I mean, I would do the same thing. That, that's okay. That's why we signed up to do this job. Um, but there's, but there's ways we can do it better. And some of the, some of the programs you're talking about, we're bringing online with our, our neighborhood patrol deputies, um, that go and combat those, those homeless camps and work with code enforcement and work with those, um, those agencies and and DSHS to, to deal with those issues. And that takes the burden off of patrol, right? So we can go handle those patrol calls. We've got the co-responders, they're easing some of that burden. Um, so those programs are, are coming online and I think you're going to con- continue to see more and more of that. So, but it does, it does take money. It does cost. And, um, you know, but we've got, I feel like the, the community around here really does support the department. You know, we've, I often remind my guys of that, uh, you know, when I was in a, when a, in a patrol squad, it's like, you know, the, the public around here really does care about law enforcement and appreciate what we do and it's and it's it's important for cops to hear that it's important for cops to remember that so very good any other questions participants we're kind of running out here and i'm going to turn it over to the chief and let him give his comments because i know he has good night everyone thank you clark you're amazing nice to meet you thank you so much okay you have your speaker on. All right. Hopefully everybody can hear me. Perfect. Thanks, Eric, for that presentation. Uh, you know, just a couple of, I, I just do a couple comments because I'm sure there's people that want to run and watch their DVR that they've been uh, recording uh, something on TV for the last hour or so. But uh, just a couple of the things that I took away from tonight. Um, I, you know, we get a lot of questions about how much training we get around these things. And I think it's important to remember like what Eric talked about was how de-escalation, uh, crisis intervention is in, it's intertwined into so much what we do. I mean, it's it's the basis of law enforcement, really. And so how it's not just two hours a year that we're getting. It is the 10 hours of firearms here, another 10 hours of firearms and its components to all of that. So there's it really is uh, a lot of what we do in terms of the training aspect of preparing our officers, our deputies for what they're going to see on the street. You know that de-escalation, uh, crisis intervention, to me is like the three components that he talked about. The idea that there's a tactical element to it. Um, there's the uh, emotional side of it, the stress management side of the response, and then just the awareness of things. You know. We talked about the traumatic brain injury was the training focus this year for two hours. I always felt like that was the big change over the last years is, uh, or one of the biggest changes was the awareness component. You know, years ago when I started as well, it was kind of, you know, yeah, there's crisis, people are in crisis, just get out there, but not recognizing how there's so many components that people could be uh, facing, you know, whether it's chemical dependency and the issues that are around that, or the mental, the different types of mental health uh, illnesses that are out there, and how we can approach those to to de-escalate and safely resolve those and get people the help they need. So uh, that was kind of a huge thing, and that the evaluation piece. Um, you know, we talked about all the trainers that we have. We go to this training, and it isn't just sit down and and listen to a presentation and then you walk out. There's a lot of scenario-based training. Um, and the, the evaluators, the trainers are evaluating your performance and giving you feedback um, so that if there's people that are, you know, struggling with the, the training component of it, um, they're getting some feedback on how to do it better out there. So um, there is a lot of this, this training that we go through that our officers uh, and deputies are provided throughout the year. So it is a big, big area for us that we focus on. So, um, We'll go ahead and wrap it up and
Again, if you have any questions throughout the week that pop into your head, don't hesitate to shoot us an email or give us a call if you have anything you want to to get answered before we meet next week. Um, I don't think I have anything else. So we're going to go ahead and let you guys go. Thanks again for being here tonight, and we'll see you all next week then. Thanks. Bye.